In fact, she could never resign herself to buying anything from which one could not derive an intellectual profit, and especially that which beautiful things afford us by teaching us to seek our pleasure elsewhere than in the satisfactions of material comfort and vanity. Even when she had to make someone a present of the kind called useful, when she had to give an armchair, silverware, or walking stick, she looked for old ones, as though now that long destitute had effaced their character of usefulness, they would appear more disposed to tell us about the life of people of other times than to serve the needs of our own life. She would have liked me to have in my room photographs of the most beautiful monuments or landscapes. But at the moment of buying them, and even though the thing represented had an aesthetic value, she would find that vulgarity and utility too quickly resumed in their places, and that mechanical mode of representation, the photograph. She would try to use cunning, and if not to eliminate commercial banality entirely, at least to reduce it, to substitute for the greater part of it more art, to introduce into it a sense several layers of art, a set of photographs of Charles Cathedral, the fountains of saint Cloud or Mount Vesuvius, should make inquiries of Swan as to whether some great painter had not depicted them, and preferred to give me photographs of Chartres Cathedral by Corot, the fountains of saint Cloud by Hubert Robert, of Mount Vesuvius by Turner, which made one further degree of art. But if the photographer had been removed from the representation of the masterpiece, or of nature, and replaced by a great artist, he still reclaimed his rights to reproduce that very interpretation. Having deferred vulgarity as far as possible, my grandmother would try to move it back still further, she would ask Swan if the work had not been engraved, preferring wherever possible old engravings that also had an interest beyond themselves, such as those that represent a masterpiece in a state in which we can no longer see it today, like the engraving by Morgan of Leonardo's Last Supper before its deterioration. It must be said that the results of this interpretation of the art of gift giving were not always brilliant. The idea formed of Venice from a drawing by Titan that is supposed to have the lagoon in the background was certainly far less accurate than the one I would have derived from simple photographs. We could no longer keep count at home when my great aunt wanted to drop an indictment against my grandmother. Of the armchair she presented to young couples engaged to be married, or old married couples, which at the first attempt to make use of them had immediately collapsed under the weight of one of the recipients. But my grandmother would have believed it petty to be overly concerned about the solidity of a piece of wood, in which one could still distinguish a small flower, a smile, sometimes a lovely invention from the past. Even what might in these pieces of furniture answer a need, since it did so in a manner to which we are no longer accustomed, Chamber like the old ways of speaking in which we see a metaphor that is obliterated in our modern language by the abrasion of habit. Now, in fact, the pastoral novels of George Sand that she was giving me for my saint's day were like an old piece of furniture full of expressions that had fallen into disuse and turned figurative again. The sort you no longer find anywhere but in the country. And my grandmother had bought them in preference to others, just as she would sooner have rented an estate on which there was a gothic dove code, or another of those old things that exercise such a happy influence on the mind by filling it with longing for impossible voyages through time. Mama sat down by my bed. She had picked up François de Champy, whose reddish cover and incomprehensible title gave it in my eyes a distinct personality and a mysterious attraction. I had not yet read a real novel. I had heard people say that George Sam was an exemplary novelist. This already predisposed me to imagine something indefinable, indefinable and delicious in François de Champy. Narrative devices intended to arouse curiosity or emotion, certain modes of expression that make one uneasy or melancholy, that a reader with some education will recognize as common to many novels, appeared to me, who considered a new book not, a thing, not as a thing having many counterparts, but as a unique person, having no reason for existing but in itself, simply as a disturbing emanation of François de Champy's peculiar essence. Behind those events so ordinary, those things so common, those words so current, I sensed a strange sort of intonation, accentuation. The action began. It seemed to me all the more obscure because in those days when I read, I often daydreamed for entire pages of something quite different. And in addition to the lacunae that this distraction left in the story, there was the fact, when Mama was the one reading aloud to me, that she skipped all the love scenes. <laughs> Thus all the bizarre changes that take place in the respective attitudes of the miller's wife and the child, and that can be explained only by the progress of a nascent love seemed to me marked by a profound mystery whose source I readily imagined must be in that strange and sweet name, Champy, which gave the child who bore it without my knowing why its vivid, charming, purplish color. If my mother was an unfaithful reader, she was also, in the case of books in which she found the inflection of true feeling, a wonderful reader for the respect and simplicity of her interpretation, the beauty and gentleness of the sound of her voice. Even in real life, when it was people and not works of art which moved into compassion or admiration, it was touching to see with what deference she removed from her voice, from her emotions, from her words, any spark of gaiety that might hurt some mother who had once lost a child, any recollection of a saint's day or birthday that might remind some old man of his advanced age, 
any remark about housekeeping that might seem tedious to some young scholar. In the same way, when she was reading George Sand's prose, which always breathes that goodness, that moral distinction with Mama had learned from my grandmother, to consider superior to all else in life, which I was to teach her only much later not to consider superior to all else in books too, <laughs> taking care to banish from her voice any pettiness, any affectation which might have prevented it from receiving that powerful torrent, she imparted all the natural tenderness, all the ample sweetness they demanded to those sentences, which seemed written for her voice, and which remained, so to speak, entirely within the register of her sensibility. She found to attack them in the necess necessary tone, the warm inflection that pre-exists them and that dictated them, but that the words do not indicate. With this inflection she softened as she went along any crudeness in the tenses of the verbs, gave the imperfect and the past historic the sweetness that lies in goodness, the melancholy that lies in tenderness, directed the sentence that was ending toward the one that was about to begin, sometimes hurrying, sometimes slowing down the pace of the syllables, so as to bring them, through their quanti though their quantities were very different, into one uniform rhythm. She breathed into this very common prayer as a sort of continuous emotional life. My remorse was quieted. I gave into the sweetness of that night on which I had my mother close to me. I knew that such a night could not be repeated, that the greatest desire I had in the world, to keep my mother in the room during those sad hours of darkness, was too contrary to the necessities of life and the wishes of others for its fulfillment. Granted this night to be anything other than artificial and exceptional. Tomorrow my anxieties would reawaken and Mama would not stay here. But when my anxieties were soothed, I no longer understood them. And then tomorrow night was still far away. I told myself I would have time to think of what to do. Even though that time could not bring me any access of power, since these things did not depend on my will and seemed more avoidable only to me only because of the interval that still separated them from me.